Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis. Today, we are going to look at a concise total synthesis of Atlanticon C. This work was published by Thorsten Bach et al. in Synlet in 2020, following on from their earlier synthesis, which was reported in 2019. Atlanticon C was first isolated by Claracuzio and Vidari in 2002 from Lactarius atlanticus, which is the orange milkcap mushroom. It belongs to the family of protoiludine sesquiterpene natural products, which feature a characteristic 5-6-4 tricyclic skeleton. This research group has previously published a synthesis of this molecule, and this paper presents a new and optimised route to this interesting compound. While this is quite a small molecule, it does present significant challenges. These include installing the fused cyclobutane group, constructing the quaternary carbon chiral centre, also fused to the cyclobutane group, and also controlling the stereochemistry of the 5-6 fused ring junction. So let's start by looking at the retrosynthesis. The first disconnection occurs at the carbonyl group, which will be installed using an allylic oxidation. The precursor to this could be generated from a beta-hydroxyaldehyde, which could be made using a base-promoted acetal cleavage of a protected diol. The cyclopentanone could be constructed using a conjugate reduction of an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone, and the cyclobutane will be installed by hydrogenating a cyclobutene ring. This heavily functionalized intermediate could be synthesized in one step using a photochemical cascade of an allylated aromatic compound, which could be made using a simple alkylation reaction of this functionalized phenol. So let's start into the synthesis. The first alkylation was carried out using chloroethyl allyl ether and cesium carbonate as a base to produce the target compound in an 86% yield. This compound was then irradiated at 350 nanometers for five and a half hours in degassed methanol to carry out a photochemical cascade to produce a racemic mixture of the product in a 48% yield. This cascade starts off with a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition between the allyl group and the aromatic ring. This produces a cyclic 6-membered acetal and a 4-membered cyclobutane ring. This intermediate undergoes a thermal disrotary ring opening to relieve the strain of the 4-membered ring and form a cyclooctotriene intermediate. Further irradiation promotes another 2 plus 2 cycloaddition to form the product, finishing the construction of two new six-membered rings and the formation of a four-membered cyclobutene ring. During the studies to optimize this reaction, the authors discovered that another product was also formed. To maximize the yield of the target compounds, the researchers found that using irradiation at 350 nanometers and a reaction time of 5.5 hours, favoured the formation of the target product while maximising conversion of the starting material. Longer reaction times led to the formation of the undesired compound 2, as shown here, which was formed by a di-pi methane rearrangement. This reaction can occur when a central sp3 hybridised carbon is bonded to two carbon atoms bearing pi bonds. Irradiation with UV light promotes the radical coupling of these two carbon atoms generating a triplet intermediate with two radicals. The strained four-membered ring then opens to form a cyclopentanone and leave the radical on the central sp3 hybridized carbon. This then combines with the radical that was produced in the first bond forming reaction to form a new cyclopropane ring and complete the rearrangement. So to take the product of the photochemical cascade further, the authors first had to separate the two enantiomers which were formed. To do this, they carried out a CBS reduction to stereoselectively reduce the carbonyl group, forming a pair of diastereomers, which they could then separate by chromatography. Once separated, they then re-oxidized the hydroxyl group back to a carbonyl using manganese dioxide. This CBS reduction, known as the cori bakshi shibata reduction, or also sometimes referred to as the itsuno cori reduction, uses a chiral oxazaborilidine reagent to control the stereochemistry of the reduction. 
This forms a complex with the substrate and borane, which acts as the reducing agent in the reaction. This forms a six-membered chair-like intermediate, where the largest group occupies the pseudo-equatorial position, allowing the hydride to be selectively delivered from one phase. This was successful in producing the reduced compound in a 98% enantiomeric excess. The researchers used Mosher analysis to determine the stereochemistry of the reduced compounds. This technique uses alpha-methoxy, alpha-trifluoromethylphenolacetic acid, also known as Mosher's acid. This acid is commercially available as both enantiomers and forms two diastereomers when reacted with the compound to form an ester. These two products can be studied by NMR and by analysing the difference in the shifts between the compounds generated using the R and S enantiomers. It is possible to deduce the stereochemistry of the compound from this difference in chemical shift. Fortunately, they were also able to crystallise one of the products and use X-ray crystallography to confirm the stereochemistry of this compound, which shows the hydroxyl group on the same face of the molecule as the cyclobutene ring. With the desired enantiomer now isolated and reoxidized, it was alkylated using sodium hydride to form an enolate, which reacted with methyl iodide. This alkylation occurred twice to produce the product in a 97% yield. This was then hydrogenated using a palladium catalyst and hydrogen gas, which selectively reduced the cyclobutene ring in a 99% yield without reacting with the other alkene present, which is conjugated with the carbonyl group, which lowers its reactivity. This was then reacted with tosyl hydrazine to form a hydrazone in a 54% yield. This hydrazone is necessary for the conjugate reduction, which involves an allylic diazine rearrangement promoted by catechol borane. This undergoes hydroboration with the hydrazone group to form an intermediate with the boron bonded to the nitrogen atom. This is eliminated along with the tosyl group to form a diazine intermediate which undergoes an allylic rearrangement with the alkene present on the molecule. This reaction produced the product in an 89% yield as a single diastereomer. This stereoselectivity is driven by the sterics, which only allows the catechol borane to approach from one face of the molecule. The next step in the synthesis was a hydrolysis of the acetyl group, which was present in the six-membered ring. This type of reaction is always done using acid, However, this compound was unstable in acidic conditions, so the researchers needed to come up with an alternative approach for this transformation. To do this, they first reacted the compound with Schlosser's base, which is formed by combining butyl lithium and potassium terp-butoxide. This deprotonated the methylene carbon of the acetyl group, allowing it to act as a nucleophile towards boron dimethoxyfluoride. This could react with hydrogen peroxide in a manner similar to oxidative hydroboration to form a borylated orthoester type intermediate. Reaction with sodium hydroxide could promote the elimination of the boron group to form a formate ester which would rapidly hydrolyze upon workup to form the diol in an 84% yield. This is not a proven reaction mechanism however, so feel free to suggest any alternatives that you might have. With this diol in hand, they then proceeded to carry out a Swern oxidation. Reaction of DMSO with oxalyl chloride forms a sulfonium chloride reagent in situ, which is attacked by the more nucleophilic primary hydroxyl group with the elimination of hydrochloric acid. The sulfur bound methyl group is deprotonated by triethylamine to form a sulfonium illit. This will form a five membered transition state to abstract a proton and form the target carbonyl group. This product was not isolated and was brought forward to the next step, which was a dehydration reaction carried out using mesyl chloride and DMAP. This mesylates the hydroxyl group, which improves its ability to act as a leaving group, and DMAP acts as a base to deprotonate the alpha proton. As both this proton and the mesyl group are on the same side of the ring, they cannot form an antiperiplanar relationship that would allow an E2 mechanism to take place. Instead, this reaction goes through an E1CB mechanism, 
where the aldehyde first forms an enolate, which then eliminates the mesyl group. To form the alpha-beta unsaturated aldehyde, a 78% yield over two steps. As the aldehyde was no longer needed, it was reduced to an alcohol using dibal H and protected as an acetyl group in a 99% yield using acetic anhydride. This protection was necessary to prevent it from being re-oxidized in the next reaction, which was an allylic oxidation using chromium trioxide and dimethylpyrazole. The dimethylpyrazole forms a complex with chromium, which then reacts with the starting material to form a carbon-chromium bond, together with the abstraction of the allylic proton. This then undergoes rearrangement, forming a new carbon-oxygen bond, together with the breaking of the carbon-chromium bond. Once again, the pyrazole group acts as a base to abstract a proton forming the carbonyl group in an 87% yield. With this installed, it was a simple matter of deprotecting the acetate group to produce atlanticone C in an 84% yield. Overall, the researchers managed to produce this compound in just 10 steps with an 18% overall yield of 14.2 mg. This synthesis presents a significant improvement over the previously published method and highlights the utility of using photochemical cascades to produce highly complex intermediates in just a single reaction step. Other highlights of this synthesis include the allylic diazine rearrangement used in the conjugate reduction and also the base promoted acetal deprotection, which is a very useful but rarely used chemical transformation. That's everything from this week's simplifying synthesis. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you have anything you'd like to see, let me know in the comments down below. In the next video, we will look at the asymmetric total synthesis of aspidophilin A.